So thank you very much for the invitation and it's a pleasure to visit. I've been visiting uh, KAIST uh, a number of times, often in the computer science department, uh, visiting uh, Professor Chong. I see some of his students are here. Um, so I'm assuming, so there's a classical question called, um, I mean, that regards embedding graph on surfaces. So it started in the 19th century, so it's something called Hewood inequality. So it's basically looking at how large a complete graph can you embed on a given surface. So that's a very natural question. And it's quite natural to, to try to think of it about what can happen in higher dimension. So when you start doing that, you somehow leave the realm of graph theory, you enter more algebraic topology, okay, homological algebra and things like that, so it becomes a bit more technical. So my goal here will not be to go into the proof in detail because uh, this is a more discrete math seminar. I am assuming that the crowd attracted here is more into discrete math. So I'm, I'm going to try to explain the connection, what you can keep when going to higher dimension and what you have to lose and where you can use new ideas. Okay? Uh, if you have any questions, please stop me anytime. And so, the very, f the very beginning is planarity, right? So maybe, maybe you have heard of what a planar graph is, right? It's a graph that you can draw in the plane where you map every vertex to a point and where you connect any points, any, any two vertices forming an edge by a pa by a straight line, maybe, or maybe by a continuous line. So you can get linear embeddings of graphs, you can get topological embeddings of graphs, and there's a classical theorem that tells you that it doesn't matter which kind of embedding you look at, because whatever can be made, can be embedded by a continuous, by continuous path in the plane, can be embedded by straight line path in the plane. You might have to shuffle the vertices around, but you can always do that. First thing is when you go to a higher dimension, we will see that this distinction actually matters in general. There are analogous, analog questions of embedding graph for which the answer differ, whether you consider linear or continuous embeddings. But here we shouldn't matter, we shouldn't bother ourselves too much with that. Okay? Uh, the classic, a classical result that we, that we will follow is that if you look at the complete graph on five vertices, it does not embed in the plane. Okay, probably most people have seen that. And there's another fact that I would like to use and keep track of. It's, uh, okay, let, it, let me try. So, so once I saw a talk by Anders Bjorner who said that there were two identities that you could write in any audience and people would recognize it, okay? And one of them, or identity or inequality, is, is this. E at most 3V minus 6, okay? So you all know what it means. Maybe. So if you, if you have a graph with V vertices, and this graph can embed in the plane, then its number of edges is at most 3V minus 6. How do you get that? Well, it's fairly easy. You start with Euler's characteristic, right? So the number of faces minus the number of edges plus the number of vertices equal two for any graph. And then you do double counting. Okay, so any face has at least three sides. Okay, so you get that three F is at least, well, every edge bounds at least two faces. So you can't, when you count the pair of a face on an edge where the edge bounds the face? At most, at most, yeah. uh, at most yes. Okay. Well, I'm counting the outside face as well. Yeah. Okay, so, so then it becomes... Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Okay, then you inject this into that and you get this. So, let's see what happens to those when we go to a higher dimension. So first step first stop, actually, will be R3. So the first thing, perhaps, to remark is um, when you go to R3, the question becomes kind of trivial at first sight. 
because for any n, kn embeds into R3. Okay? If you want, so assume that you're drawing your edges with straight lines. If you want two edges to cross, that means your four points must be coplanar. But you can choose any number of points in R3 where no four are coplanar. Okay, so if you use those n such points and you draw straight, straight segments, then your graph will have no, self -inter no intersection. Okay, so you can, you can always embed. So to make things interesting, let's look at Kn, but where I feel the triangles. Okay, so now I not only connect the points, but I, f I actually feel linearly the triangle spanned by any triple of vertices. And now it turns out that this, if you, as soon as you take six points, you no longer embed linearly into R3. Why? Well, what I can do is take one of those vertices. Okay, so I have a vertex here, and now I have many triangles. Okay, that this vertex forms, and so on. And I can take a small sphere centered in this vertex. Sufficiently small to exclude all other vertices. They are all outside. And now I look at, so, now on this sphere, every vertex that is connected to my center vertex will give me an edge here, and this edge will pierce the sphere into a point. Okay, and any triangle will intersect the sphere into a path, and the path will connect those two points. So as soon as I'm drawing all triangles on six points, if I pick one point and I look at what happens in its neighborhood, I find a drawing of K5. So I will have a crossing. And this crossing will be a crossing intersection between two triangles. Okay. So... I think you can reduce six to five also, no? Uh, exercise. Okay. <laughs> okay. And this thinking is, uh, is what we call looking at the joint, right? So looking at any way fixing a vertex and looking at all the faces that use this vertex. Okay, oh, links, sorry. So this is looking at the link of vertex. Cannot, uh, must be planar. And if I do the same reasoning, I can also transport this inequality in some way. Right? So it becomes a bit more messy because now whenever I fix a vertex, I can count the triangle using that vertices. This will be the E. And I can look at the neighbors, that will be the V. And I have to sum up, to, to consider those inequalities for each vertex in turn, sum them up, recombine them, and so on. And what you, can, what you can prove is that the number of triangles is, say, bounded linearly by the number of edges. In any, in any two-dimensional complex, okay, sets of triangle, that embeds in R3. Okay. So we can still do we can still push some of these results from the plane to R3 by looking at neighborhood of vertices and looking at what happens around it. Now, if we go to higher dimension, this is no longer the case. Okay, so first, what do we mean now? Wha what are we trying to draw? Uh, not just, is it, all, is it still triangles and so on? So, the right setup to look at this is to look at Simplicial complexes, so abstract, simplicial complexes. Okay, this will be the analog of the combinatorial graph. So what an abstract simplicial complex is, so I have a set V, they play the same role as the vertices, and I have 
a subset K of the subset of V. Okay, so I have a family of subsets. And this family is closed under taking subsets. Okay, so whenever, what this means is if A is in K and B is in A, then B must also be in K. Okay, so you can think of a graph as a simplicial complex where you have the vertices that they are singletons in K and the edges are pairs in K. Okay, and now an embedding of K. It's simply a map where every, every singleton of K is sent to a point. Any pair of K, so element of K of size 2, so because of this being closed under taking subset, uh, if I have an element of size 2, that means that both the singletons of that thing are also in K, so that means they have been mapped to points. So I can connect them by a path. Okay, so, so let's say I have A, I have B, I have A, B, so A has been mapped to a point, B has been mapped to a point, so I can, I can connect them. And now if I have, say, A, B, C, a triple in K, so that means I, I, I should also have C somewhere, I should also have A, C, and B, C, okay? And now when I take those three passes, Together they form a cycle, so I can fill this cycle in a way, right? So this cycle is the image of S1 into R3. So I simply take an image of the disk D2 into R3 that coincide with this cycle, okay, on the boundary. So I fill those disks, so those things, and this way I can map. I can define embeddings of K, so of course the, the simplest version of embeddings will be the linear embeddings, where I simply draw line segments and take convex all of the points. So convex all triangles, tetrahedra, and so on. But I could also look at it in a more topological way. And the distinction, as I said, in the plane doesn't matter. As soon as you go to higher dimensions, there are complexes that can be embedded Top, uh, topologically, but that cannot be embedded linearly or not even piecewise linearly. Okay, so uh, one has to be a bit careful there. Now, when when looking at at uh, planarity, it's natural to look at complete graph, right? So look at how big a graph can you embed where you you put all edges. So similarly, here we will look at delta n k, which is a k skeleton of the n-dimensional simplex. Okay, so that's all sets of size at most k plus 1 in n plus 1 element set. Okay. So, there's a slight shift here between people doing topology and people doing combinatorics. Uh, it's this plus 1 here. So, uh, well usually when you do combinatorics, you like to count, right? So, for you, a pair has size 2. Uh, a pair will be drawn as a path. So, a path is one dimensional. So for topologists, a path as size 1, as dimension 1, okay? So size 2 gives you dimension 1, size 3 gives you dimension 2, and so on. And so it's very natural to look at something where you fix both how many vertices you have and what is the maximum size of a subset that you allow, okay? And the two parameters will be 
the dimension of, so you can think of it as taking all faces up to a certain dimension in some big simplex. Okay? Um, and usually the notation is this one. And I forgot to say, of course, uh, so what I'm going to talk about now uh, is, uh, is joint work with um, Isaac Mavia, Pavel Patak, Zusana Patakova, Martin Tenter, Uli and Uli Wagner, okay? who are from uh, Vienna. Uh, Prague, and then it gets messy because he was in Vienna, student of Uli, and he moved to Chicago. Uh, they were in Prague, and then they moved to Israel, and now they are either in Israel or in Vienna. Okay? <laughs> so. <clears throat> what is your saying? All something of size less than equal to k plus one? All yes, all, all sets. sets. All sets. sets. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so complete graph would be all sets of size 2 in a, subset, in a set of size uh, n. Okay, so kn is the same as delta 1 and minus 1. Okay. So the idea is that k4 will be the skeleton of the three dimensional simplex. Okay, K4 equals the one skeleton of a tetrahedron, which is a, a three dimensional simplex. Okay, so now the question is a natural question is. How big, so how large can N be for, I'm lo I, I look at delta Kn and I want it to embed into Rd. Okay, so I have a target space Rd. I want to embed the k-skeleton of the n-simplex into Rd. I'm asking, can this be, is there a maximum size? Or is it unlimited? And as before, a general position argument. Sorry for in the question. Yes. Uh, doesn't k appear? k, k is the... k. Is. So, so right now I have three, ver three parameters. So n is a function of k? Is it? Yeah, yeah. n is a function of k and d. Oh, k and d. I see. Yes. Okay? So, for d equal 1, uh, sorry, d equal 2, and uh, k equal 1, then we get n equal 4. We can embed k4 into the R2, not k5. Okay, for d equal 3, k equal 1, we get infinity. Okay, and if we look at d equal 3, k equal 2, well then it's at most 5. So when, when you say n is 4, that means uh, it's a subset. Uh, what is ah, <laughs> yeah, uh, a bit right. right. Uh, n is 3. <laughs> this infinity doesn't change, and yes, and this is what we argued by looking at the links. Okay, does the question make sense to everybody? Okay. And then the exercise was that this last n also equals three. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're bored, just focus on that. That will keep you awake. Okay. Um, so. As we said, every graph embed in R3, okay, because you can choose points, many points in R3, as many as you want, so that no four are in the same plane. Now, if you look at, if you think about R4, okay, and if you try to draw, draw triangles, 
for two triangles to intersect, that means that the six point should be in some R, how many? R3. Okay, so if you have two triangles that intersect, the two planes that they span have a line in common. So together these two planes they span a three-dimensional subspace. Okay, I have two triangles in R4. Uh, sorry, in R5, yeah. 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 So let me think about two triangles in R5. Uh, or in, gen in general, two triangles. So if, if the triangles inter if they intersect, for them to intersect, okay, the plane spanned by one of the triangles and the plane spanned by the other triangle should share a line. No? Oh, no, no, sorry. No, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Should, should share a point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should share a point. And that means that, um, that the six point, okay, should lie in a common R4. Yeah, in a common four dimensional. So, the six point, so intersection is not empty, implies the six point. Uh, lie in common R4. Okay? Just like when two segments intersect, the four points lie in common R2. Okay? Now, as soon as you go to five dimension, you can choose arbitrary many points so that no six lie in a common R4. Okay? So that means that if you want to draw all the triangles on endpoints, it's, a, it's always enough to go to R5. In R5, you can always do. Okay, so D equal 5, K equal 2, you get, again, N equal infinity. And in fact, if you go to dimension 2K plus 1, okay, then you can always do, you can always draw everything, just by a general position argument. Yeah, sorry for, for the slight confusion. Okay, so now that means a particular, a particular question of interest is what happens just below this critical dimension, below this dimension, right? So let me reformulate the question is, and get rid of this parameter and just look at what happens when the target image is precisely when you can't always use just general position argument. Okay. So what is known? Well, so that's a question that was studied in the 1930s. So, and there are, let me mention one result and one conjecture. Uh, first, there is a Van Kampen Flores theorem. So that's the early 1930s, 31 and 32. Uh, so they, prove, they proved it independently. Um, which says basically that if you take the 2k plus 2 dimensional simplex and you just look at its k skeleton, and you get a complex that does not embed into R to the 2K. Okay? So this is really the critical dimension, 2K. If you go to dimension 2K plus 1, anything can embed. And if you go to dimension 2K, then there always are simplices. N is always finite. Okay? And this is for any K. If we look at K equal 1, what do we get? we get that delta 1, 4, which means k5, does not embed in the plane. 
Okay. There is a conjecture. I think the first. So it was stated several times independently. The, f the first one that I heard about is due to Grumbaum in the 70s. It was also asked by Zarkaria, by Kalai, by Day. The question is, assume you have uh, a complex and it Im embeds in R to the 2K. Does the number is the number of k-dimensional faces okay. bounded it's number k minus one dimensional faces Like a question, not a conjecture. So what is the conjecture? Yeah, it is. Okay. <laughs> so conjecture? Yes. Yeah. So this is a conjecture generalization of 3n minus 6. If you are in the plane uh, and you are embedding a graph, then k equal 1. Okay, so you want to bound the number of edges in terms of the number of vertices. Okay, the next case, interesting case, because we only look at even dimension here, is what happens if you are trying to embed triangles into R4. So then the conjecture says that you should be able to bound the number of triangles as a linear function of the number of edges. It's open. Okay, so two, four, K equal 1, and it's a two-line proof, open for k any k larger than 2. Is there some conjecture of total number of uh, bases in k um, that could be bounded, by a li bounded linearly by the number of zero dimensions? So if you... And if it, this is true, mm. then it Yeah. So, so one question is, uh, what happens if we add, for example, we are embedding triangles in R four, and we are adding the edges that we don't really need to to draw the triangles, right? So, because we have a certain to have a set of of triangles, you you know we have a, a bound on how many edges this this will get. So so we could easily extend this. But the question is, what can, can, can we do more? So it's also, uh, so I, I don't know if there's any specific conjecture, and there should be something possible. Right now, what we looked at is how planarity goes to, you can think about it in R3 or in Rd, as embedding simplicial complexes. There's an, another natural generalization, it's to look at manifolds. Right, so you take a graph, and of course, let's look at, so the simplest, non-planar graph, you look at K5. Okay, no. Okay, so I cannot draw it, so I, I have to have some intersection. Here's, here's a one drawing with only one intersection. I can always get rid of the intersection by modifying the surface on which I draw. And say, add a little bridge here, okay, on my surface. So think of me modifying the plane by adding a small pass, okay? And now I can draw without crossing. So for any graph, 
what I'm just saying uh, it is at four manifold and for any n there exists a two manifold m such that kn embeds in m can our manifold have boundaries so here it will be enough to look at a two manifold that is compact and without boundary <coughs> okay why compact because i can start by drawing on the sphere right it doesn't really matter to be on the plane I draw on the sphere and then i add simply uh, bridges on the sphere okay i don't add any boundary i don't okay now you can play with the quantifiers and ask okay but if i give you a given uh, a certain manifold how large a, a graph can I embed in that manifold? Okay, so, and that's the he would inequality. That's the question that he would look at first. If Kn embed, so the good thing with the two manifold that are compact and without boundary is that they are easily described. So. They are either orientable or non-orientable, and in each case, they are, they are parameterized by their genus. Okay, so on a two-manifold with genus G, then and I will, uh, I will always have to look at the. Inequality minus three minus four yeah. and minus four is at most. So usually it's phrased in terms of the Euler characteristic uh, or the genus. Let me phrase it in terms of the Betty number, one dimensional Betty number. Okay, so beta one of uh, the manifold M, beta one of M. Z2, okay, and if this is the genus is G, uh, this should be, I think, 12. Yeah. Yeah. 12 minus the other characteristic of your manifold. Okay, so. That bounds again the size of Kn given the manifold. And one way to prove this is as 3n minus 6 by applying Euler and applying some double counting. Okay? So now the question is okay, what is there here? So we can, we can take graph embed them in the planes and we can relax the space go to higher dimension we get we can go to more complicated manifolds we can also try to do both at the same time on that in that direction there, there is a precise conjecture that was formulated about 20 years ago by Kuno let me try to phrase it not as a question So the conjecture is that if you if delta k n embed in M a two K manifold uh on Kinol suggested to take it compact and K minus one connected. Then n minus k plus one, choose k plus one, should be bounded by two k plus one, k plus one times the kth Betty number of n. Oh, 
So if you apply it with m equal r to the 2k, this is zero. So it tells you that this should be zero. Okay, so you shouldn't have any way of choosing k plus one elements into n minus k plus one. Okay, so that tells you that n minus k plus one Did I get the sign right? Yeah, n minus k, n minus k plus one should be less than k plus one. Okay, and so you get von Kampen Flores. If you set k equal one, okay. Then, uh, what this gives you, you can check, is exactly this bound. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, so this is at most zero. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. So this seems like an interesting, if this is true, this seems like a, a nice way to condense, to bring everything under a common umbrella. So what we could do is not quite prove Kuhnel's conjecture, not at all actually, by far, but we could prove that if n embeds in, in a 2k manifold, then n is bounded by some function of this. Okay, so the question is meaningful. We don't get the right bound. Hmm? Function of k and beta k. Okay, I'm going to state the precise result. But so the question is meaningful. As soon as you bound the so the right parameter to generalize he with inequality will be beta k. Okay, and as soon as your complex embed in a in a two k manifold with bounded beta, beta k, then its size has to be bounded. Okay? So when k is 1, uh, do you have numbers correct? Like m minus 2 choose 2? Or here you have m minus 3 choose 2, so... So you get... Okay. n minus 2 choose 2 should be at most... Uh, so 3 choose 2, that's 3 beta 1. Okay, so this is what? This is uh, uh, n minus 1, n minus 2, no, n, minus n, minus two. N, minus two, n minus 2, yeah, n minus 2, n minus 3, less than 6, less than six. Yeah. Okay. beta 1. So this seems wrong, except that you get the shift between dimension and cardinality. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's a trick question at this stage in the talk. Uh, okay, so what could we do? Uh, okay. So if delta n k embeds in m, a 2k manifold, So we do not need this assumption. Okay, we do not use this one either. Then n is at most 2k plus 2 choose k times beta k of m and z2 plus 2k plus 4. Okay, so it looks like this one, except that instead of bounding n to the k plus 1, what we bound is n. So we are like some exponent k away from the conjecture bound. 
but at least there's something correct. Okay. So maybe now I have five to ten minutes. Yeah, you have at least ten minutes. Okay. Um, so let me tell you how we we do that. Okay. So there is a little bit of topology involved, but not much. Uh, in fact, what we do is we we use some topological result. So a theorem of Volovikov. So the, let me give you the idea of the proof. So the first ingredient is Volovikov theorem. Uh, which tells you that if you have uh, delta k n embedded in m a 2k manifold so it not only looks at what are at uh, embeddings it looks at embeddings that are trivial in a nice sense so such that so if f is an embedding so uh, okay let me first state what it is so if you look at the chain map induced by this embedding on the k-cycle no, so into hk of m if this is trivial then n has to be uh, strictly less than 2k plus 2. Okay, so what this says is another way to think about a bending graph on a manifold is requiring that whenever when you embed so if you embed so consider the case of the torus one way to embed k5 on the torus is to do this okay but when you do that you will always have some triangle that will not be trivial okay that will be separating your surface so here for example you would have uh, I guess this one here okay this cannot be filled okay it's not a triangle that you can if you if you look at it on the surface it will it will look like this okay so in that case the image of this cycle in this homology will be non-trivial Okay, and so what Volovikov's theorem says is uh, this is mandatory. Whenever you embed a graph in any, mani any two manifold, there will be such a cycle as soon as you have more than five, more than four vertices in your graph. Okay, and this generalizes in higher dimension in the same way as von kampen flores theorem. So what we're doing, in fact, to prove this is to show that if you give me a map of with n large enough of delta n k into m I can always cook up some map of 
and delta k 2k plus 2 into this so that when I compose every cycle will be trivial okay so so the second idea is start with a map f delta n into M and try to map delta 2k plus 2k into delta nk so that when you compose the homology becomes trivial. This mapping homology becomes trivial. Okay? And what we show is that if n is large enough, you can always do that. So you can always compose in a way that your triangle will be trivial. So let me illustrate this idea on the case k equal 2. Okay, so now I have triangles. Okay? Ah, sorry, it's my stopwatch. So, for triangles, so assume that. Um, so this Volokhov. Volokhov. So it generalizes concomitant force. Yes. Also, right? Yes, it does. Because uh, if you map to R K, R D, it must be trivial. There's nothing. There's nothing in R to to the two K. Okay. So now the idea is assume that you that you map on the torus. A complete graph, okay. Uh, so you have many points, okay, and you have edges, okay, mapping them. And uh, what we what we're going to do is we're going to pick five vertices. We're going to map them to some of those five vertices. And now we want to build passes between them so as to draw K5 in a way where such a cycle does not exist. So K equals 1, not two. Uh, K equals 1, yes. Yes, yes, K equals 1. That such a cycle does not exist. How we do that is, so we have to draw these cycles. And the idea we use is that we work in homology homology mod 2 so wh one thing we, one, one trick that we can play is take a barycentric subdivision for each triangle now map these vertices also here and use the embedding that we have so so now I want to realize a triangle here that will be trivial. Okay, so I have a set of points. I pick one point for each of these. I pick also one point for, for each of these. Okay, and now instead, maybe in my original map, the path between those two vertices was this one. Now what I'm going to use is the uh, composition of these paths. This becomes my new edge between those two blue vertices. Same here. Okay. Uh, I'm missing something. Yes. Of course. Now, I'm going to map the blue triangle, this blue triangle, to the sum of these six triangles, small triangles. Okay. Now, this to for for this sum to be trivial in homology, it suffices now that all six triangles have the same homology class. Okay, because if they have the same homology class, I'm just adding the same thing 
six times, six is even, so I get zero. So looking at, the, at this problem this way, now we only have to find a large number of vertices where all triangles have the same homology class. Does this sound familiar, like Ramsey type theorem? Okay, I can just look at the hypergraph, uniform hypergraph of size 3 on these vertices and color every triple by the homology class of the triangle. I will find some homogeneous uh, subset. Okay, and I can use this subset via subdivision to find cycles that can be filled, that are trivial. So that's the kind of idea that we use. We don't need to use Ramsey, right? The kind of bond we obtain does not at all look like something you get from Ramsey. Uh, because simply there's some simple linear algebra going on behind that you can use and uh, to get your collisions. But so, in a way we can push some of those results, again from graph theory into higher dimension, again using simple ideas, still from so basic and combinatorics. Exponential in beta k, right? Uh, that gives you exponential in beta k, exactly, because we use, so you, first step is you use Ramsey, you don't think. Second step is you use the pigeon principle, and you think a little bit and you get exponential in beta k. Third step is you, you use some different trick to, so you use the same idea, but you use a different way to choose your triangles, and you can get it uh, to this kind of bond. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, I see you're coloring by with beta k colors. Right. It's more like for every vertex, you look at what it gives you when you add it to any edge. Mm -hmm. And you, you associate to uh, every edge the vector of deformation, of modification obtained from all the vertices. Mm -hmm. And then you, you use the pigeonhole principle and you will find a way to reroute every face so that computation works well. And uh, if you want to push the bond a bit better, uh, a bit further, instead of rerouting every, every edge by a point, you reroute it by a sum of points. Okay, and then you, you, you do everything in terms of chain maps and, and you get better bonds. I guess this is a clue that maybe I should stop. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much.